Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we explore the life and mystery of Sol Invictus, or Unconquered Sun, the Roman sun god who spanned many rulers, inspired many, and spurred dozens of mysteries that we will journey through together. We will also explore his mythological family, his sisters Luna and Aurora, as well as his beloved daughter Circe. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find comfort in the space that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. You have no obligations here. There is no to-do list. All you have to do now is rest. And rest does not have to just mean sleep. Rest is simply allowing your body to be still, relieving it of any tension, allowing your eyes to close, and letting your mind wander peacefully. By allowing your body to slowly relax, you are beginning to rest, and soon your mind will follow. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into the mattress with every passing moment, I want you to try and imagine a moon and sun above you, the light coming from both of these is gentle, so gentle that it is as if they are simply night lights above you, twinkling against your ceiling. As you breathe in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Try and imagine the sun drifting down towards you. Slowly, this tiny sun brushes over the top of your head, and with its touch, a warmth spreads through you. With the sun's embrace, you feel any troubled thoughts any stress of the day melting away. And as those thoughts and tense feelings melt away, the moon begins to make its way down to you. The moon, too, brushes over the crown of your head, only this time The feeling it inspires is completely different. You feel a sense of utter calm travel through your body, serenity that is like a welcome embrace from the universe. Then the sun travels down to your shoulders and torso. That same comforting warmth starts on your chest, 
and travels down your torso, blanketing your lungs and heart with a sense of relaxation. You feel yourself breathing a little deeper now. You feel your heart pumping free of any concerns or stresses, feeling entirely whole and connected to your being. Once more, the moon swoops in next. Its silvery light allows you to breathe just a bit deeper. It allows your body to sink just a bit more into the mattress as you relax more and more and more. Your muscles are unwinding with their celestial touch, returning to the state they were in before you did your work for the day. Then, the moon and sun travel to your arms and legs. You feel the sun brush over your arms, unclenching your fists and unwinding each and every tense muscle you may be carrying. Your shoulders fall away from your ears as that warm feeling surrounds you, like you're in the world's most wonderful bath. Then, the sun brushes over your legs, your feet relax, no longer rigid from carrying you through the day. You stop tensing the muscles there, allowing them to sink into the mattress and find a truly comfortable position. And then, it is once more the moon's turn, as she shines her light on your arms and legs. There is a softness that embraces them, that reminds them it is okay to let go for the night. They have done their duty, and it is time for them to simply be. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find comfort in the space that we are in, here and now, let us begin our story. Soul Invictus was not always Soul Invictus, not always the unconquered sun. Rather, for quite some time in history, he was conquered because he was forgotten. Soul the early sun god of the Roman Empire was referred to as Sol Indigis, an early Roman deity who was seen as one of the minor importance by a cult that dissipated well before 1st century AD. Sol Invictus, however, was a Syrian sun god who was first promoted and encouraged under the Roman Emperor Elagabalus, who tried to start a cult that was very short-lived and unsuccessful. Indeed, Sol was having a hard time getting his celestial feet off the ground. Then, around five decades later, the Roman Emperor Aurelian succeeded in establishing the cult of Sol Invictus in Rome, alongside several other traditional Roman cults. He held a festival on the 25th of December 
to worship the God of the sun, who is viewed as unconquerable, because at the end of each night, the sun was able to rise and overcome the darkness of night, giving life and light to the earth once more. There has been much debate over the years on whether Sol Indigis and Sol Invictus are different iterations of the same God, and whether the 25th of December was the celebration of the God at all. But tonight, we will not be questioning the cults, nor the decisions of the emperors of Rome. Tonight, we will be sliding into the mythology of Saul, of his family, of his powers, and expanding upon it as we find a night of soothing rest with these celestial gods, with Sol, Aurora, and Luna, words that you may be rather familiar with. First, let us begin with Sol, Sol Invictus, Sol Indigis, the god of the sun. It is said that Sol resided in the sky. His home was never spoken of in detail, but one can imagine the halls that the god of the sun would walk through. A castle set upon the clouds, dancing with the stars above in the inky blackness of space a castle of warmth, with long halls peppered with paintings of orange, sanguine, salmon, and goldenrod, the colors that he held close to his heart, the colors that he spread across the sky every time he flew. Though many gods are viewed as all-powerful, as cruel and cold, and as capable of failure and jealousy and deceit as humans are, there was something different about Sol. You see, Sol's task was not easy. The weight he carried and his importance to the world was not one to scoff at. He was, after all, unconquerable. A god who would rise in his castle in the clouds. A castle peppered with those paintings that reminded him of the task that lay before him every lazy morning. He would awaken well before the rest of the world to a sea of darkness, a landscape washed in the cold touch of night. He would step out onto the clouds, bouncing gently with every step he took, as though he was crossing freshly fallen snow to reach his chariot. His chariot was drawn by four golden horses, horses that shone just as brightly and vividly as he did every single morning. Sol would slowly settle in his chariot. Once more, he would look down over the landscape before him a landscape shrouded in the darkness of night, a landscape full of people curled up in their beds, 
waiting for the sun to rise so they could greet a brand new day full of potential and full of hope. And then, Sol would snap the reins of his chariot. He would sense the chariot leave the edge of his clouds, the edge of his kingdom, and enter into the open sky. As Sol made his way in an arc over the world, slowly, slowly, he would bring the light with him to every bit of land that he traveled over. As he moved along, he pushed the darkness of night back and back and back and back, filling the world with light and potential. This was not a simple task. Sol had to stand upright, his sword outstretched, as his horses marched on, keeping that darkness and those shadows at bay. It was a demanding task for anyone to uphold, and it wasn't swift and easy, even for Sol. Sol would fly for the entire day, working as he watched his people below emerge for the day. While many gods would grow jealous or angry with the humans they were protecting, Sol did not. He loved to gaze down from his chariot to see what the people below were doing with the sunlight he provided them with. One of his favorite experiences to watch on earth was what occurred every morning near the mouth of a river. He would watch as children emerged from the huts of the small village, all rushing out to embrace the morning light with glee in the special way that only children can. The children would run and giggle as they made their way toward the water. Sometimes they would hold hands as they made their way over to the sparkling river. Other days they would race each other moving as fast as their feet would carry them, as though they were the ones trying to banish the darkness from the sky forever. They would splash in the water together, giggling and telling stories and making up games with all kinds of rules. He always found it funny that the children would make rules just to break them, and often Sol found himself wishing that more people could break the rules, keeping them bound to certain things. Sometimes the kids would sit by the riverbanks, lying back and letting the warmth of the sun dry their clothes before they had to go back in for lunch. Sol knew that without a doubt, the kids would be snapped at for entering the house with wet clothes. So he always put a little more effort into drying them off than anyone else he encountered. By mid-afternoon, he would pass by the kids, moving past the far mountain range on the other side of town. But it was here that there were even more impressive sights. 
even more wonderful displays of humanity for him to encounter. There, he would find a couple that he always enjoyed watching. The couple he observed was young, freshly married, and it seemed to Sol that they had just acquired the farmland that they were working. He had a feeling that they emerged from their house to work about the same time that he emerged from his castle, and that gave him a great sense of kinship with these strangers that didn't really feel like strangers at all. They would work in unison in the field below. The woman would hike up her skirt and run over the fields to plant seeds, to sow, to harvest vegetables. The man would chase after her, telling jokes and wrapping his arms around her on occasion to hug her. Their garden was not the most impressive out of all the gardens that Sol flew over, but there was something different about it. It was amateurish, a mess of fences and posts and plants that weren't planted entirely right, and yet the garden radiated love, acceptance, and growth. Sol swore he could feel the connection between the couple working on the farm in the land below. He could see their love in the plants, the trees, the oddly shaped carrots and apples and cucumbers that they were hard at work harvesting. He greatly admired their unity, their perseverance, the connection that they shared to the land and to each other. As he flew over them, he would watch them every day, wishing them and their community well feeling grateful that his rays of light made their farming and their survival possible. And then, Sol's journey would ever so slowly begin to come to an end. There was one more mountain range he had to pass over before he could return to his castle and every night, as he did, he knew he wouldn't be doing this part of the journey alone, because there, below him, sitting on the porch of their mountaintop home, was a father and his daughter. The girl was young, maybe five or six years old, and every day, as Sol began to sink over the horizon, she would playfully tap her father, her eyes illuminated with awe and wonder. The father would wrap his arms around his daughter, pulling her tighter against his chest. Sol could always see the smile on his face as the man held his daughter tight. He could tell the father was appreciating the moment, soaking it in and savoring it, wishing he could bottle it up for the future. Sol always made sure to put on a show for them. He worked as hard as he could to paint the sky in the most beautiful mosaic of colors. 
He splashed the horizon with pinks, purples, oranges, blues, yellows, and reds, mixing them together to create the most beautiful moving art piece on earth. He knew he did his best work on the days where the daughter would lean over and wrap her arms around her dad before she whispered, I love you, dad. And hearing that made his long day traveling across the sky, his sword outstretched before him, worth it. Exhausted, Sol would then return to his castle in the sky. He would look overhead at the stars twinkling and rest as he thought of the day he had given to the world. He thought of his sacrifice and all the happiness it provided to the humans of the earth, the children, the farmers, the fathers and daughters, and it filled him with a sense of gratitude and belonging. And, fortunately, Soul's life was far from lonely. You see, Soul was not the only one working hard to keep the days and nights, dawns and evenings moving as they should. Sol's siblings, Aurora and Luna, both served a grand purpose alongside Sol, and perhaps the more well-known of the two is Luna. Luna, as her name implies, was the divine goddess of the moon. Some referred to her as the two-horned queen of the stars, and the queen of the stars she was, indeed. Luna's home was often discussed by people within the religion. Her castle was as bright and reflective as the moon itself, giving the area around it an otherworldly silver glow. Though she was the queen of nighttime, her home was always bright, the dew of the grass around it illuminated even on the darkest of nights. While Sol drove a four-horse chariot, with each horse representing one of the four seasons, Luna drove a two-yoke chariot called a Biga, with two horses drawing it along, one black horse and one white. The two horses represented the moon's travel on a twin course with the sun, one of light and one of darkness. Luna and Sol had a close relationship. They were both necessary, and they could both connect over the task they were given at birth. Every evening, as Sol began his descent over the horizon, Luna would awaken in her luminous home of silver, gray, and white. She would tiptoe down her hallway, a hallway lined with paintings of glistening silver, sparkling white, and soft, gentle blues that you would miss if you weren't truly looking. She would tiptoe out over the lush grass surrounding her home and turn her gaze up to the sky. 
watching as the last streaks of orange, yellow, and red painted the world around her. She would slowly walk to her chariot, taking in the feeling of the dew forming in the grass around her feet. Now, they reflected the last few rays of sunshine, but soon they would be silver drops suspended on the grass, reflecting the brilliant moon overhead. She petted her horses every night as she stepped into her chariot, giving them the respect and admiration they deserved for the journey that lay ahead of them every single night. And then, when the time was right, her chariot would arc up into the sky, bringing darkness behind it like a thin veil. While some people like her brother, found the darkness to be stifling and disappointing. She saw the beauty in it, and she knew other people did, too. Because with the darkness of night and that ethereal glow of the moon, people were given peace. People were given time to reflect time to breathe, time to do nothing but stare up at the night sky and simply be without the pressures of society or the pressures they felt the need to put on themselves. Luna, too, had favorite parts of her time spent up in the sky and it started in a low, lush valley, overflowing with forests and streams. While some people may think that the nighttime is a scary time to be in the forest, Luna knew better. Nighttime is the time where you can truly take in every inch of the forest for what it is. The time where you can meander aimlessly, watching as the forest rests and refreshes itself for the next day. There are no calling birds, no people traipsing through the leaves, Nothing but nature at its calmest, the universe at peace. And there was one woman that knew that just as well as Luna did. A woman that Luna saw almost every single night. The woman was young, maybe in her twenties. After eating dinner, Luna would watch the woman emerge from her home and make her way out into the grass. She was always barefoot, always a bit hesitant for the first few steps she took into the dewy grass in the moonlight. But then she would get a pep in her step, as though she had dropped chains she had been carrying throughout the day. She would hike up her skirt, bunching the soft cotton in her hand as she picked up the pace, until she was positively skipping through the grass and underbrush her hair floating behind her in soft, flowing tendrils. The smile on her face made Luna's job all worth it, 
she would watch the woman wander through the countryside for hours, lying down in the soft grass on occasion, reading books by candlelight and moonlight against the steadily flowing river, running her hands through the leaves on the trees, causing the moonlit dewdrops to tumble down down, 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 into the soil at her bare feet. By the time Luna was crossing into the next valley, the woman would be making her way back home. Almost always, she had a bouquet of wildflowers held tightly in her grasp and a smile unlike any other on her face. And then, Luna would find herself in the next valley. This valley was a valley that oddly reminded her of her childhood, of the wonder and peace that can be found so freely and easily in your youth. Because in this valley, there was a mother and her son. It was clear that her little son, a boy of just four or five, was afraid of the nighttime. Luna felt bad about this, but deep down, she knew it could be resolved. She made sure to shine her light down on the boy's bedroom window, a little brighter than on all the others, giving him a chance to see the beauty of night. But Luna wasn't the only one helping him see that. Every night, his mother would light a candle in the open window and sit down with her son, a book in hand. And it was then that she would begin to read aloud, telling him stories and tales of the nighttime, tales of joyful things happening at night tales of fairies and candlelit walks and nights of swimming under the bright moon. Luna would feel her whole body relax as the young boy began to smile, enthralled with the story of the nighttime being safe, of it being fun of it being rewarding, even. And almost every night, just as Luna would cross into the next valley, she would see the boy's tiny little eyes flicker closed as he fell asleep, a peaceful smile on his face. That feeling of warmth would follow Luna as she traveled on the final stretch of the night. And it was here that she would see the couple. They were a poor couple, living on the outskirts of a big community, with a garden tinier than all the other gardens in the land. Their house was falling apart and their clothes were hardly rags, and yet they were the happiest couple Luna had ever seen. Every night, the couple would race outside to watch her as she passed. The man would wrap his arms around the woman, keeping her warm in the night air. He would whisper stories into her ear as they watched 
the stars twinkle overhead and the moon continue to make its arc. Luna loved the way they admired her with such wonder, with such appreciation. It was as though she was their entertainment, their only source of joy in a long day of hard work. Whenever she could, Luna would try and order shooting stars to fly across the sky as she passed. And every time that happened, she would watch the couple embrace eyes filled with wonder and awe. And as Luna settled down over the horizon, grateful, she was able to bring another calm night to the world below. She would give a smile to her sister, Aurora, who was the sibling that would begin the cycle all over again. Aurora was the goddess of dawn. Though she was not working as long as her siblings, she was just as important. As soon as Luna retired for the night, Aurora would renew herself, ready to prepare the sky for her brother's arrival, ready to ease the transition between the night and the day. Aurora would awaken in her home in the sky. It was a more modest home than her siblings, nestled in the heavens atop the clouds. But it was the most beautiful just like Aurora herself was the most beautiful. Aurora had many men lusting after her, wanting her beauty, wanting to hold onto her a little longer than anyone else ever had. She was a fleeting creature, a woman who would disappear without you even realizing something else beautiful was coming your way. And though many men loved her and wanted to be with her, Aurora didn't stay with anyone. Instead, she would sit with them, asking them to reflect on the moment at hand, asking them to appreciate the now, and then she would be gone. Aurora would awaken in her humble home full of plants and paintings and artwork of all shapes and sizes, and she would slowly make her way out to a chariot of her own. She would climb in her chariot and take a deep breath of the last bit of night air, appreciating the briskness, reveling in the calmness that it had the ability to bring. She would snap the reins of her chariot and then she would be off. She'd sail across the night sky in her chariot, full of saffron, bringing the colors of dawn with her as she rode. A cascade of orange, pink, yellow, and blue would wash over the land as she sailed by, preparing the sky for the arrival of her brother. It was a short trip across the sky she would take, much faster than that of her siblings. 
but it gave her just enough time to appreciate the view, to appreciate the world coming alive with color beneath her, to appreciate the sounds of birds beginning to stir, to appreciate the fresh, brisk air that only dawn could bring, and then she would land back at her house and watch as her brother began his journey. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.